Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than what? All that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. Remember that? To him be glory where? And in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. How many of you memorized that this week? Let's see your hands. All right. All right, today, the journey begins with prayer. Let me just say this. Uh, we're going to, uh, at the end, uh, take a few minutes during the last song and bring our kids and the workers in. And then we need to take care of a little family business, voting on our uh, forward um, budget plan. So if you consider Believer's Church, your church, your family, we want you here to... Um, to be, be a part of that, okay? So today, we're actually going to talk about prayer. Um, have you ever thought about this? Why do many believers not pray the way they should? Maybe you don't pray the way you know you should. And you would say, well, Mike, I, you know what? I just don't have time. You don't understand my schedule. I've got two kids, three kids, whatever it may be. And some of you might say, well, prayer doesn't really work. And if prayer worked, I would do it. And you may not say that verbally, but uh, it's kind of practically the way that you have chosen to, to live your Christian life. But today we're going to talk about this great mystery of prayer, and that is God is sovereign, all right? So God, God is sovereign to do whatever God wants to do according to His good purpose. But, here's the, you ready for this? Man, us, we, woman, have a responsibility to pray. Now, I, I know some of you in this room. Um, today, you've prayed for a long time for that tough case. Some of you have shared those stories with me, and I've been praying with you. Maybe I haven't told you, but I have. I keep a, a journal and I keep those prayers, and I'm always praying. And you know, maybe something on your heart that you've been praying for a long time. And maybe it's the salvation of a child, or a person that's addicted to something in your family, or uh, someone in your family that um, had something happen to them that should have never happened. Okay? Or maybe a spouse who's treated wrongly. Uh, maybe a marriage that's falling apart. Maybe a business situation or a health issue. So, with the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man to pray, that's what we're going to be talking about today. And some of you may be in this place and you're thinking, I don't even know if God hears me anymore. I've thought that before. Maybe it's this tough case in your life. My prayer this week and my goal this morning is if there's some way through Jesus and His Word that your prayer life would be re-energized. Re-energized that when you leave today, you go, I'm going to be praying. I want to, be, I, I want to pray to this God in, in heaven. And I, I want to show you from, from what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, he shows us something that's really amazing. He shows us how important prayer is and how it should be this big priority in our lives. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And what Jesus is going to show us is what's important is the motivation of our prayers how we pray, why we pray. And it's right in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus, in a sense, kind of gives us this outline for prayer. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to begin in verse 5. When you're there, say, let's go. All right. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Let's pray. God, would you just birth in our hearts, and uh, all of us today, just a burden for prayer, a passion, God, for, for prayer. Knowing that, that prayer is effective and it's efficient and that it should be a priority in our life. Teach us today. In your name we pray. Amen. Now I want to start 
if you noticed in that passage, there's negative and there's positive. So what I want to do is I want to start with the negative and show what Jesus condemned in prayer. And then we'll end with showing what Jesus actually commends in prayer, okay? Jesus condemns this type of praying, and it's really twofold. The first thing is this, praying to be seen by others. Praying to be seen by others. And here's what he is doing. He's calling out these street-performing Pharisees who would stand in the public square or in the arena, quarters in the temple of the synagogue, and in such a way to be seen by others, they would begin to pray. They would just you know, raise their hands and start praying these long prayers and start babbling on. We'll talk about that. But understand this, in the first century, there were plenty of opportunities for any kind of theater, really, that you wanted to, to do with hands raised, you know, these eloquent, long prayers so that people could praise them. There was this desire to kind of be seen by others. Yeah, getting the prayer Oscar, I guess, in that day and time was something big if there was such a thing. But here's what Jesus says. You ready? Don't be like that. He's like, no. So in order to understand um, this type of prayer, we have to understand in Jerusalem what would have been happening. They would have had this um, shofar horn that would uh, blow. And all the people um, would at least three times a day pray. And if you were in the community and all of a sudden you heard the the horn sound, you were supposed to stop, raise your hands to the Lord, and speak these loud prayers. Because that's kind of the setting in which Jesus is teaching this. And, well, the, the Pharisees, they decided to plan their afternoon walk right during when they knew the, the horn was going to blow. You with me? They're walking down the most busiest part of town. <laughs> Right? That's what's going on here. And Jesus going, that's Pharisees, don't, don't do that. So how do we guard against that? Well, you know, here's, here's, here's what he says. Go into your prayer closet. Right? And this used to kind of confuse me. Um, but in order to understand exactly what Jesus is talking about here, you have to go back to the Jewish sense of of Jesus and his time, and they would have something called the tallit in Hebrew. This is a towel. This is not a tallit. Trust me. You can look it. You can Google it, and it looks far different than this. But just let this represent kind of a, a tallit. This this morning is a fancy name for a shawl, basically. And every Jewish man was supposed to have one of these. Now they always had two garments. They had an inner garment, and then they had this, the outer garment. Right? The outer garment was always heavier usually than the inner garment that they would have on. And they would use it for prayer. Now Jesus, during this time, when he said, go into your prayer closet or into your private room, you have to understand something. They didn't have prayer rooms, right? I mean, you know what they had? They had like a stone square building. So it's not like they could go, excuse me, just me, I'm going to go over here to the prayer room, in my prayer closet, and, and pray. So we know that's not what, what Jesus is talking about. So when Jesus says, go into your private place, prayer closet, if you study the Jewish history, they would close themselves off kind of symbolically from the world with this tallit, right? They would just kind of close themselves off like this. And that would symbolically separate them from the world and allow them to kind of get alone with God. So I think that's kind of neat. In a sense, they had like a traveling prayer closet, if you think about it, right? But Jesus tells them and warns them, hey, look, don't be prideful about this. And this is, this is what, he was, what he was getting at. Now, he's not rebuking, catch this, he's not rebuking praying out loud. We're going to make sure that we understand that. Or praying in front of people. That's not what he's saying. But people who pray so that they will be praised by men... And not praying to have a genuine, heartfelt conversation with God through a relationship through his, Jesus Christ. That's what, he's, that's what he's after from all of us this morning, okay? So, here we go. Don't, don't pray to be heard by other people. Don't pray to be heard by other people. Look at verse 7. It says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. 
For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. It's in Matthew 6, verse 7 and 8. So in ancient times, they thought you might be heard by God if you would just give these long-winded prayers. In other words, the longer I can pray, the more God might listen to me. I just think we get in trouble. There's nothing wrong with a long prayer. But it can, if we're not careful, start coming to us and it becomes dis- disingenuous as we continue to pray. So nothing pray- wrong, wrong with praying long prayers and being persistent in your prayers. I mean, Jesus really wants us to be persistent in our prayers, right? You remember Paul in the New Testament? How many times did he pray for God to remove the thorn in his flesh? Once, twice, three times, didn't he? What about Jesus? In the garden, how many times did he pray, God, would you remove this cup from me? One time? Two? Three times, right? So he wants us to be persistent. And Jesus himself was was the model for that. And, And what he's warning against is this. He's like, don't pray in such a way, the way that the pagans prayed. And here's what was happening. This kind of type of paganistic prayer had in infiltrated the society of the first century, and they would offer up these repetitive phrases over and over and over again. And what Jesus calls that here in the Scripture, I love it, He calls it Babel. <laughs> you ever met somebody who babbles? <laughs> Y'all are laughing. All of you know one. Some of you are going, have you met my husband? You should meet my coworker. They are a babble. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about in prayer, babbling. In other words, saying these same syllables over and over, same phrases over and over, thinking that through somehow this ritualistic action, God's going to hear me. If I can do this, keep doing this. And that's what he's saying. Hey, avoid that. Don't do that. Okay? So, when we pray in the church, you know, we're really not trying to prove our maturity or how we can actually handle the Word of God. Uh, that's, that's not our goal, you know, that by quoting all the Scripture during our prayer. And there's nothing wrong with that, but to, to be quoting it so others may think, wow, look at you, that's not the goal. So prayer, you ready, is a conversation with God. Prayer is a conversation with God. I mean, you just talk to God, Right? Like you would talk to me. I mean, when I talk to Karen, no one says, hey, go have a conversation with Karen. I just talk. One of us usually has a lot more to say than the other, if you know what I mean. No, 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 I'm not downing her. It's proven that women um, say almost twice as many words as us men do. That's not across true, across the board. Did I get myself in trouble? Lord, forgive me. You know my heart. I'm not going to babble on. Just forgive me. So when you get before the Lord, just remember this. Right? It's a conversation with God. Again, telling God your heart. And it's you listening. Ready? It's you listening through the Word of God. To the voice of of God. I, people ask me all the time, I just, I, wanna, I, I would love to hear from God. I, like, I want to hear this audible voice. Listen, if you want to hear what God says, read the Word of God. You want to know it? Read it. I mean, if you want to hear God speak to you audibly, guess what? Read the Word of God out loud. Now, Here's some clarifying questions to really, really determine the condition of our hearts. I guess to see maybe kind of where we're at. Here's a question. Do do you long to pray in public in front of people more than praying in private by yourself? Or how often do you pray alone? Right? Think about that. And I honestly think, uh, I honestly think at the end of my prayers, if I think I've just done a great job I'm almost positive God's going, I'm not impressed at all. I'm really not, Mike. So Jesus is saying, this is a kind of prayer I'm condemning. And, you know, folks, listen, we're we're constantly battling the flesh, aren't we? We don't want to be 
to pray to be heard by other people. How many of you have ever been sitting in a, in a crowd of maybe four or five people and you're going, kind of going around the room praying and you're kind of the last one to pray and the whole time the other people are praying, you're sitting there and you're thinking through what you're going to say. Now, I know none of us here are guilty of that, right? We just need to be careful. Instead of agreeing with what others are saying, and then genuinely, when it comes your time to pray, to say, God, here's my heart. Here's what's going on. I, I don't know how to pray in these eloquent ways. I don't know. Nobody's ever really taught me how to pray. So would you teach me how to do this? So here, here's what he commends. You ready? Pray to be heard and seen by God. Jesus says when you pray, pray in private. And it's not, again, that he's against praying in public or even praying out loud. And Jesus is getting at the motivation of our prayers rather than the manner of our prayers. So I, w- I want to show you something. I think it's amazing. And it's a, it's a parallel account of this in Luke 11. If you want to flip over there, you can. But it's an account of Jesus giving the disciples a formula for prayer. And you've probably read this a hundred times, if not more. You realize this is the first time... And only time where the disciples come to Jesus and ask Him to instruct them on how to do something. Okay? Uh, They've never asked before and will never ask again for Jesus to teach them something specific. Now, they've asked Him to do a lot of things, but not this this way. So, of of all the options in kingdom ministry, they could want Jesus to teach them. Notice what they asked for. Look at verse 1, Luke 11, 1. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. To me, this is mind-blowing because I want you to see what they didn't ask here. Look at this. They didn't ask Jesus to teach them systematic theology, right? They or expository preaching, although that's good, or evangelism strategy, although that is good, or how to grow a church, or how to be leadership, how to walk on water, how to take pizzas at a youth event and multiply them. I'm trying to wake some of you up. That's not what they asked. Here's what they asked. Jesus, we all want to learn one thing. Jesus, we want to learn one thing. Can you teach us how to pray? Like you pray. You see, by watching Jesus pray, they realized they could learn all of those other things. So if they could nail this, then all these other things would just come along with it that we just talked about. So they simply said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And I got to wonder if that's a question we would have asked Jesus, or we would ask Jesus today, or if we would have been there with him on this time? Would we have asked him that question? Verse verse 2 says, And he said to them, When you pray, say... Now stop right there just a minute. I want you to see something, okay? Let's pause there. Did you catch what he just said? He doesn't say, All right, you guys need to start praying, or you need to pray more, guys. He's saying something really amazing here. He's saying, As you're already praying. Did you catch that? See, Jesus realized praying is not taught in in a particular book in a certain way. You don't learn how to pray by going to a conference, although that could be a good thing, or by going to a particular seminar, although that could be a good thing. You learn how to pray by praying. That's the way you learn. So Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. Now all of us have probably said the Lord's Prayer, right? Right? This is actually the disciples' prayer. You'll find the Lord's Prayer over in John 17. But and let, let me just say, there's nothing wrong with praying the Lord's Prayer. Uh, you know, my thoughts are just don't pray it in such a way where it's meaningless. You know, mindless words. Just always guard your heart against that. But I think Jesus gave us an outline for so much more here. It's more than just repeating words over and over. I think this prayer outline that he gives us here in this passage is kind of like a skeleton's bones uh, of an outline by which we come behind and we put the flesh and the skin on. So if you were to pray the Lord's Prayer, here's what that might sound like or what Jesus might envision. You ready? God, I thank you that you're a personal God. Not just a distant God. You're my God. You're my daddy. 
And Father, I pray today that by your will, I will be able to carry out your kingdom. That when people see me, they see you. And Lord, I know that every need I have, you will give me. You'll provide my daily bread. And as I provide for my family, God, let it be a blessing to other people. Lord, I know that in order to have a relationship with you, I've, I need to forgive my brother. And I know that you've enabled me to disseminate or be a disseminator of grace to other people. So as you forgive me, I offer forgiveness to other people. Lord, I pray right now that you protect my family from evil. God, protect my kids and my wife from anything that might harm us. For yours is the kingdom because you, the God above all things, are worthy. Amen. Now watch this. You ready? Amen. Comma. No period. Comma. Key to today. First Thessalonians, what does it say? Pray without? Right. Why? Because this is a constant conversation with the Lord. So how do we move forward in this kind of prayer life? I want to give you two ways and we're done. Um, kind of prayer life Jesus is talking about. Number one is this. I would challenge you to pray for other people. Pray for other people. People ask me all the time, well, Mike, should I pray for myself? What do you think? What do you think? Yes, absolutely, right? You should pray for yourself. Now, so you need to start with the person who needs it most, and that's usually me. Amen? So, and then you kind of go out from there, from your spouse and your children and your family and your church and your co-workers. But here's the thing. We don't want to stay there. Can I ask you a question? Are you praying for people who harm you? I mean, it's one thing to pray for people who are kind to you. But do you pray for people who attack you? I'm not, I never said this was going to be easy. Amen? I mean, when, when, when someone attacks you, the best response is always to pray for them. And it not only will change them, but it will change you and how you look at it. And I just say, it's really hard to be mad at somebody you pray for. You know what I mean? It's really hard. And I would just say, folks, listen, love him or hate him, you need to pray for our president of the United States. I don't care if it's uh, Barack Obama or Trump. You need to pray for him. God knows he needs our prayers. And pray for God maybe to change your children's attitudes instead of yelling or screaming at them. What if we did that? Maybe as you pray for your coworkers, do you know that one that just kind of gets under everybody's skin, especially yours? Pray that God would change their heart. Ladies, pray for your husband and stop talking about him so negatively to your girlfriends. Men, stop putting your wife down in public and start praying for your wife. You know, most marriages don't need another counseling session, but what they need is a consistent prayer ministry. That's what most couples need. To pray against God's enemy, the devil. The question is, will you be that man or woman today? I and mean, protect your family through this weapon of prayer. Ian Bounds said this, you know, talking to man for God is a great thing, but talking to God about man is a better so pray for other people. The second thing is pray to know the heart of God. The issue in the text is verse 8. I don't know if you caught that or not, but Jesus says, um, he's like, listen, pray, pray to God, but know that God knows what you need before you even ask it. So, you know, you're praying, say, God, would you do that? Yes. God, you know I, I'm already on it. God, would you just say, I think I, I got it. All right. So you're probably thinking, well, why even prayer? And here's the, response. here's the response. We pray because we want to know God. All right? We pray because we want to know God. You see, prayer is not just trying to get your request into heaven. It's trying to get heaven into you. It's getting to know what's on the heart of God. Richard Blackaby said this. He said, prayer 
is not just sharing what's on your heart, but knowing what's on God's heart. He knows your heart already. That we want God to show up so that He can bless this list of things that we want Him to do as opposed to just, God, I just desire to be with you, God. I'm just so thankful as we're singing that song this morning about your goodness and your, your reckless love toward us. See, it's a, this is about a relationship with Him. This is not about some genie in a bottle. So as we've been talking about these kingdom principles um, we're on one today, folks. I'm telling you that will radically change your life, and that's prayer. You see, God wants us to spend time with Him. So it's often not that God will change what we are offering to Him, but that the one doing the offering will be or might be changed. Okay? So I got a challenge for you. You ready? Now, last week it was Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. This week, it's different. Um, it's called uh, five. Five days this week. Monday through Friday. Or if you want to, whatever, how many, have, you want to spread that out. Five days, five minutes. Five days, five minutes. You can remember it by your hand. Five days, five minutes. And I want you... When first thing when you wake up, now you may want to brush your teeth, your spouse may appreciate that, but, or something. But the first five minutes of your day, I want you to spend in prayer talking to God. Alright, that's a challenge. First five minutes. Now here's the hard part, you ready? Don't ask God anything for you. That's the key to this. Don't ask God anything for you. But simply, thank God and have this attitude of gratitude. Yeah, you can pray for other people, but for you just to be constantly thanking God for everything that you have. Now, you'll probably get a minute into that and, and look at your watch and go, man, I know Pastor Mike said five minutes, so I just can't do this. Yes, you can. Trust me. You can do it. Think about everything He's done in your life. Maybe you want to put that song, uh, The Reckless Love of God. Is that the name of the song? It's on YouTube. Pull it up on your phone or something. And, and first thing in the morning, just sit there and watch that. And then go spend this five minutes with God. And just thanking Him and for everything in your, in your life. And listen, you ready? I promise you. I promise you, when you come back in here next week, you are going to be different. So you got my challenge, and now I'm making a promise to you. If you will do this, you'll, you'll come in here different. Five days, five minutes, see what God does. Could it be that the reason we're not seeing God move in our life or in our church life is not unanswered prayers but unoffered prayers let's pray